Thank you everyone for joining us today for today's webinar as part of the special topic series on cooperative management, governance, and leadership. I'm Karen Miner, the Managing Director of the International Centre for Cooperative Management at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. For those that are less familiar with the Centre, we are leaders in professional education and research geared specifically to the cooperative and mutual enterprise model. And we do this in an international context, both the networks and the knowledge that we engage with. And today's group of participa participants and the topic of today's webinar are a testament to that approach. Please do note that we are accepting applications for our incoming cohorts of online part-time master's, graduate diploma, and certificate programs with all programs starting in mid-August. And I encourage you to get in touch with us about these and help us spread the word out to your network. As for the webinars, if you weren't able to tune into our recent webinars on human-centered management, diversity, equity, and inclusion, leveraging cooperative principle number five on education and training, and cooperation and the Preston model in the UK, you can find these recordings on our website, managementstudies.coop. We are recording today's webinar, and a recording will be available on our website later today. All right. Let's jump into today's webinar. We are thrilled to have doc, Dr. Marcelo Vieta delivering today's webinar titled Lessons from Argentina's Worker Recuperated Enterprises, Cooperatives in Times of Crisis. Marcelo is based out of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto in Canada. Marcelo researches and teaches on social solidarity economy, worker cooperatives, workplace and organizational learning and change, the Sociology of Labor and Social Movements, and Critical Theory. He has recently published a book, which is the theme for today's webinar, and he has published in numerous peer-reviewed venues and critical magazines in English, Spanish, and Italian. Marcelo is a very good friend of the International Center for Cooperative Management at St. Mary's University, including being an instructor in our online Master of Management Cooperatives and Credit Unions. Marcelo will present for 20 to 20, 25 to 30 minutes. This will be followed by a moderated question and discussion period. So please use the questions feature that you see in the GoToWebinar control panel to submit your questions throughout the presentation. That will help me, who will moderate that session, think about which questions in what order when we get into that session. So now I'm going to turn it over to Marcelo. So thanks, Karen. Um, I'm so pleased to be doing this today. And I wanna thank the International Center for Cooperative Management for asking me and for allowing me to talk about my book and to present my book to you. So that's, um, I'm, I'm thrilled and, and, and honored. Okay, let me just see if we can move forward here. Uh, I just wanna to move to my first slide, okay. Okay, so just I just want to set this up by saying that I'm going to be referring to Argentina's worker recuperated enterprises as ERTs. So if I use the word ERT or the acronym ERT, I'm referring to Argentina's worker recuperated enterprises, empresas recuperadas por sus trabajadores. So I just wanted to give uh, that heads up. Okay, so I've been working with, oops. Let's go back. I've been working with um, Argentina's worker recuperated enterprises since 2005. I've even worked at them or at one of them for about a month as a student intern back in 2005, although I mostly got in the way, I think. Um, but I've been also collaborating since then. So it's been a good 15 years that I've been working with them. Uh, I've been collaborating with the program, with the Programa Facultad Abierta or the Open Faculty Program. It's an extension program out of the University of Buenos Aires. And they've been working with, they're a university research team, and they've been working with the ERT movement uh, since the beginning. So, um, and I'm from Argentina, so I wanted to give that context. I came to Canada when I was five, so um, in, in many ways I, 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 was, uh, I was an insider culturally and, um, and socially as well. So that opened up doors for me, by the way, because uh, I could, you know, for, for obvious reasons. So this book was published uh, published a, a few months ago as a result of my research and theorizing on worker self-management in Argentina. Um, 
it's research and theorizing that actually begins with the voices of the ERT workers, their ideas, their practices, and their creativity. So the book is both a macro sociological political economy that strives to situate the ERT movement historically and materially. It also develops a social theory of worker self-management that I call, and I prefer to call the Spanish, uh, the Spanish uh, word, autogestión, and I'll explain why. And it's also an oral labor history and a microsociological look at the labor process in the ERTs and these uh, new worker cooperatives. I conducted over 60 interviews with workers, uh, union leaders, social movement activists, and uh, government officials, and I've also engaged in case study work as well. So the main questions for today that I, I want to situate this within the current crisis ultimately, but I want to speak to first the crisis that these worker recuperated enterprises emerge from. So firstly, what can the cooperative and social and solidarity economy learn from the Argentine crisis of 2001, which is where, uh, when most of these emerged, and the worker recuperated enterprises movement? Secondly, what specific contributions do the protagonists of the worker recuperated enterprises and other social and solidarity economy initiatives based on collective self-management um, what contributions can they make to an, uh, to an economy based increasingly on cooperation and care? That's so much called for right now. And thirdly, what new discourses, lessons, and practices of autogestion or worker self-management can we adopt now in response to, to this moment of crisis? So let me open up by talking really briefly about crisis. And I'm just going to cite three, three thinkers. Uh, three authors. Crisis are moments of potentiality for another reality, as a critical theorist that wrote these words in another moment of social upheaval in the 1960s said, Herbert Marcuse. Recently, Naomi Klein has said that crisis blows open the sense of what is possible. And in a 1980 novel, Elizabeth Drabble, writing about uh, uh, English middle class people, said, wrote somewhere in that book, that I remember reading, anything is possible, it is all undecided, right? So lo let me open up by saying, by um, walking through four cases. I'm gonna start right into it by describing four cases that I worked with in Argentina. These four cases make up the four ERTs that I spent a lot of time in. So Chila Ver, de Trabajo, Artes Gráficas, is a 14-member print shop in the city of Buenos Aires. From a workplace of 50 employees during its heyday in the 1980s, its nine remaining workers would spend eight months occupying the shop, sleeping next to their printing machines, and facing off against state repression. In 2002, they did this to defend their place of work after the former boss fraudulently declared bankruptcy. Assisted by their neighbors and other ERTs at the time, they would become a cooperative in late 2002. Chile Verde is now a beacon of the ERT movement. Uh, they're still around. This is the place that I worked at for a month. And they're a, they're a beacon and a model because they were one of the first ones to open up um, a recreation, uh, a community center for the community and a K-12 popular education equivalency program. Unión Solidaria de Trabajadores is a 99-member waste management and construction firm in the province of Buenos Aires, just 10 kilometers from the city of Buenos Aires. UST emerged from a public sector contractor owned by Argentina's largest multinational, Techin. After 25 years of experience managing and restoring the massive 40-acre waste dump and ecological park, and threats of losing their livelihoods forever, the workers took over the establishment and created a cooperative in 2004. They still manage the ecological park and have created a hub of local community activity. Comercio y Justicia is a newspaper in the city of Cordoba. They converted, Argentina's second largest city, they converted to a co-op by their 60 journalists and print shop workers after the former owner sold the paper off to a Brazilian equity firm. 
And that firm then would also declare bankruptcy fraudulently, which is a common, which was a common occurrence at the time in Argentina. I'll, des I'll describe why in a minute. This is the first recuperated newspaper in Argentina. Now, uh, there are about nine, uh, nine or 10 recuperated newspapers in Argentina. And it was the first where the workers actually bought out the firm from the former owners rather than seek expropriation. And I'll explain that, what, what I mean by that in a minute as well. And then finally, Salud Junin, Clinica Salud Junin. This once private health clinic was taken over by 25 of its formerly uh, mostly female nurses on the very eve of December 1920, 2001, the day of the massive implosion of the neoliberal model and the massive popular uprisings. So after several months of occupying the clinic without pay, when, former, when the former medical owners refused to pay their one-year backlog in pay, so they, had a, a, they owed the workers back pay for one, years, for one year, uh, the Salud Junin workers decided to become a cooperative. And it is now an innovative neighborhood health clinic taking care of the needs of people working in the informal or gig economy with a sliding scale unique form of community health insurance plan. Salud Hunin's nurses and former maintenance staff make up uh, most of their members and they contract out doctors from around Cordoba to come in and see patients, right? If I press the, the button too hard, it goes to the next slide. So it goes two slides. So. So there are about 400 ERTs now in Argentina, and they total uh, between 16 and 18,000 workers. They were they emerged from defensive struggles to save jobs to offensive struggles to redefine what it means to work and to work cooperatively. They're interestingly inversely related to the country's GDP. So when the GDP goes down, ERTs go up. And this shows both the tenacity of workers and underscores research indicating that co-ops often tend to form in times of crisis and they survive crisis really well. They're present in all of Argentina's urban economic sectors and across the Argentine territory. The largest group of ERTs, interestingly, are represented historically, are in sectors that are represented historically by the most militant and activist unions in Argentina. I want to return to this in a minute. So there's five major conjunctural realities or uh, situational uh, aspects or moments that underscore uh, why ERTs emerged when they did at the turn of the millennium. And they're still emerging, but this is when they really started to explode. In Argentina at the time, you saw heightened economic precariousness and crises at the level at the micro level of families and businesses. Secondly, the entrenchment of deep class divisions, very visible in Argentina at the time, the haves and the have nots, who they were, the rise of resistive subjectivities, the concretization of tight community bonds, especially at the local and territorial level, and new forms of cooperativism and workplace solidarity. In answering the question, why did ERTs emerge in Argentina? I took a political economy approach and we have to see why neoliberalism uh, was allowed to happen and how it unfolded. So throughout the 1990s, Argentina embraced a series of stark neoliberal policies that included privatizing much of its public sector services and assets, fixing the peso to the US dollar, deregulating barriers to direct foreign investment and dismantling long established labor guarantees. Ostensibly, this was designed to curb the massive hyperinflation of the 1980s and kickstart a floundering economy. The results of these policies were ultimately counterproductive. By the mid 1990s, capital began to flow out of Argentina en masse and local small and medium sized enterprises could not compete. So how did owners react to this, SME owners? Well, as SME bankruptcies, massive layoffs, and unemployment rates soared to record levels throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, and as business owners, often in collusion with court trustees and judges, began to engage in nefarious asset stripping, uh, asset stripping schemes, or picking up shop and opening up somewhere else with cheaper labor, 
more and more workers from across broad section of Argentina's urban-based economy began taking matters into their own hands. They began to see that what, what was going on and how exploited they were, they were getting. By the early 2000s, more and more threatened workers, collectives, would then occupy clinics, companies, factories, workshops that had employed them and convert them to worker co-ops. Often at this time, without even the, the help of local unions, although unions did, um, did assist later on. Okay, I'm trying to go forward here. So I need to go forward to my next slide. There we go. So how did working people react? Well, starting around two decades ago, a two-folded movement of resistance and renewal brought together Argentina's social justice movements. On the one hand, this was a broad movement of protest by rebellious subjects who had had enough of corruption, capital flight, and the catatonia of the neoliberal experiment that led to the subsequent socioeconomic crises. There was a massive financial crisis, and Argentina declared its default. On December 19, 20, 2001, there ensued, if you've seen the movie The Take, a massive revolt uh, by the middle class and the and working classes. So on the other hand, it was also a massive bottom-up project of reconceptualizing and proposing alternative socioeconomic arrangements. The social justice movements developing in Argentina at the turn of the millennium emerged from the growing systemic cracks of the neoliberal model that had been festering for decades. As the cracks broadened and compromised constituted powers or established powers hold on the nation's frayed fabrics of social compromise, rebellion and alternative experiments from below contagiously expanded and began to spill out through the cracks and into new experiments. So for, I'm just, there are many uh, of these experiments and social justice movements that emerged, but I want to just uh, described for and how they directly um, critiqued and contested neoliberal forms of capitalism, but also created alternatives cre um, in the process. With no bosses to rail against or workplaces to strike, the piqueteros, organized groups of the growing masses of the unemployed, would go on to cut off the main distributive veins of capitalism by occupying Argentina's national roads and barricading themselves in the piqueteros would temporarily shut down the distribution of commodities and recuperate the pavement for places of horizontal organizing. ERTs, in turn, would seize the factories, capitalism's sites of production, and reconstitute, reconstitute them as open spaces for communal production. In the process, as I will touch on shortly, they also recuperated workers' capacities to cre create their own wealth and co-produce social wealth and create their own labor. Neighborhood assemblies, would occupy the sites of reproduction of life and labor and public spaces, right? Including parks and plazas and created people's assemblies. So they contested in doing so, then the failing state's grip on power and their lack of being able to do anything really for local people. And they recuperated directly democratic processes for local governance. And at the same time, they were refuting this corrupt version of uh, representational government and state authoritarianism. And then finally, local barter clubs and alternative currencies would directly challenge the circuits of finance and exchange, capitalism's main channels of accumulation. I draw theoretically from E.P. Thompson, uh, a British Marxist historian, in his concept of the moral economy. Well, I use the moral economy of work, right? So spearheading the emergence of ERTs, for instance, a wave of workplace occupations swelled as the exploitation uh, workers experienced on shop floors became increasingly intolerable to them, as labor contracts were explicitly violated by employers, and as the political system which had delivered workplace security and social benefits for the past, uh, over the past four years, evaporated. So this class compromise or this expectation, right, of I'll give you my labor and you give me these securities evaporated, right? And so that's why I call it a moral economy of work. So what needs to be underscored is that these popular rebellions of turn of millennium in Argentina were not mere protests uh, limited to a politics of demand. They were rather both actual counteroffenses by working people against the worst effects of neoliberal enclosure and experiments, and also creative experiments 
um, by working people to create new community-driven socioeconomic institutions from below. And this was captured in the slogan of the protest of 19 and 20, 2001, which was que se vaya en todo, everybody in the political and um, uh, legal establishment uh, leave now. Evocatively articulating the three major stages needed to convert workplaces to co-ops in Argentina, some ERT protagonists have borrowed the slogan from um, the landless peasants and workers movements of Latin America, of Brazil, occupy, resist, produce. And I'll describe some of this process uh, that workers take in, in two seconds here to recuperate a workplace. Within this, there's an embrace of autogestión, and it also suggests ERT protagonists' social memories, we can't forget this, of other Argentine working class traditions, including a long history of activist unionism, cooperativism, and union-based democratic shop floor organs, such as uh, internal work, workers' commissions, stop, shop stewards' movements, and, um, and workers' assemblies. So these just didn't emerge out of nothing, but emerged out of this rich context and also um, rich history as well. ERT workers and my books, uh, two main concepts are autogestion and recuperation. But let me just spend two seconds on autogestion. Autogestion is self-management in English, but it's inadequately translated as self-management. And autogestion is a mixture of two words. The Latin and the Greek autos means same, self, same. And in the Latin, it's gestio, or to manage, to gestate. In English, we know this as self-management. I think this word, this concept, captures this two-folded nature of rebellion, rebelling against, but also one that guides a prefigurative creation of another socioeconomic reality. A worker from Comercio Justicia that I interviewed defined self or autogestión in, in a way that I, I've never found a better way uh, to define it. And this is the possibility that we all people have to realize ourselves professionally, economically, and in our capacities to labor. It emerges from within ourselves and together with the people with whom we want to share this realization. But without sacrificing personal freedom, without sacrificing personal dignity, and from our own developmental potential. It is, in other words, about the possibility of the full development of the human being. Recuperation is about workers taking back what is rightfully theirs. The recuperations of workers living labor, right? For themselves rather than for masters and bosses. And secondly, the return of control over workers' creative productivity for themselves and by themselves. So recuperation, if you look at the dictionary, and I'm using the Spanish dictionary, but the Oxford English Dictionary has a similar definition. It's mostly a transitive verb, to take back what was once had, to attain again what one already had and lost, to put back into service again, to return to a normal state, to bring something back to its normal state. All of these things are recuperated when workers take over enterprises and convert them to cooperatives. The, co the creative and productive capacities of the workers, our, our workers and working people are ours as human beings. So they are ours to take back, right? So to recuperate. So regardless of what private property laws say, which was a socially constructed and instituted concept, right? But ERTs are much more than just recuperating a factory. In my book, I talk about and work out how there are seven things recuperated in, uh, in the process of taking over a factory and converting it to a cooperative. Number one, the creative skills and capacities inherent in workers' labor power, our promise to labor, our promise to be creative, our capacities to be creative and productive. Number two, the surpluses that are created from workers' own efforts, associated labor and voluntary cooperation, the labor process, the division of labor, social wealth, and workers' dignity. Cooperation. Cooperation is ultimately what is created um, by these workers taking over and recreating workplaces. But it's something that human beings have been doing uh, already always since we've uh, emerged as a species, right? So ERTs, ERT workers transform formerly capitalist workplaces into worker co-ops 
cooperatively, collectively. Their very existence is a critique and an affront to the capitalist exploitative firm. And they do this um, in, uh, out of their co uh, collective and cooperative efforts. They learn how to do this informally and on the path of doing. They learn how to be cooperators on the path of doing. And in interestingly, they consider themselves first and foremost always workers, laburantes, and then cooperators. They learn how to be cooperators uh, over time and in, in the process of doing. So my book, so the, the main contributions of e the ERT movement and the ERT movement protagonists are these. And I want to spend time talking about, uh, in my final minutes, the radical social innovations of ERTs right, that illustrate the recuperative moments. I learned these and I was led by the very workers themselves in conceptualizing these. So it's, I didn't invent these concepts. The workers themselves uh, talked to me about them. The first thing that's transformed, or one of the first things or major things, are worker subjectivities. Workers transform from managed employees to self-managed cooperative workers. And this is a massive transformation, right? From receiving a paycheck to being in control, and that's all you do when you go home, at, at, you know, when your shift is over, to then having to self-manage yourself and collectively self-manage your work. And Candido Gonzalez offers a great synopsis of his personal transformation that I'll let you read on your own time when you get um, a copy of this, um, of this PowerPoint. ERTs and their protagonists collectively come together to overcome their challenges as well. They do this in many ways, both within the shop and between ERTs and with other social movements and union movements. To, sum our, to summarize these major, um, uh, major collective ways of overcoming challenges, they've organized under umbrella organizations that are kind of uh, a parallel union organizations. They work with traditional unions. Each sector has their own union, but the ERT movement has created their own umbrella organizations that um, are voted on. Their representatives are made up of ERT workers from uh, across Argentina. They're elected uh, by the workers themselves, and they represent the needs and interests of ERT workers, both to the state and uh, to unions as well. And they've managed to do amazing things. They've managed to institutionalize and normalize work at ERTs. They've managed to transform Argentine bankruptcy laws and expropriation laws and other laws to benefit um, workers, to privilege and benefit workers that want to take over workplaces and convert them to cooperatives. They have uh, established a right of first refusal legally uh, that if a firm is closing, workers must be given uh, first dibs at taking over the firm or converting it. Um, and now with the new government of Alberto Fernandez, a return to a more leftist uh, government, um, key leaders from the ERT movement now find themselves in, in, in government positions um, in the Ministry of Social Production and in Argentina's umbrella organization for cooperatives and social and solidarity economy organizations, INAES. And currently they're, they're working on um, developing a new law of recuperation of productive entities to normalize this process even more. So radical social innovations, these are novel solutions to social problems that are more effective, efficient, sustainable, or just than existing solutions. And they're novel processes, outcomes, and social benefits. I call them radical in the case of Argentina's ERTs because they directly contest neoliberal capitalism uh, in many ways. So let me just quickly, and I have five minutes left in my final five minutes, let me just quickly go through uh, four radical social innovations that we see in these firms. First, they become uh, social and solidarity as they, uh, these ERT firms practice social and solidarity economic practices as collective responses to the continuing crisis and threats and challenges. I've just described some of them. Other ways are humanizing rather than speeding up work, recycling production, um, refusing production if it's too onerous on the firm, uh, designing many breaks throughout the day, and um, uh, assisting other ERTs in their times of crisis and when they are taking over, when their workers are taking over workplaces. Um, I can mention many, many more. 
sec uh, another social radical social innovation they create more economically and socially just workplaces the one that really stands out in argentina is that over 71 percent of them probably more closer to 80 or 90 80 percent of them practice complete pay equity across the board while all uh, of these workplaces are administered by recallable workers councils and workers assemblies and by the way they meet probably the workers assemblies the collectivity of workers meet uh, every two weeks or every month which is much more than the required monthly or yearly meeting of the workers assembly or of a cooperative members assembly required in by argentine law right um, they also uh, innovatively transition or transform the labor process um, and um, give uh, responsibility for the ex for a certain uh, area of production to the expert in that in that uh, aspect of production, um, and they're flexible and nimble as to how they change the pro the production process depending on what their uh, production needs are. Thirdly, and this is these are my two favorite ones, um, they. Um, they symbolically tear down and actually tear down the imaginary walls dividing the workplace from the rest of society by opening up shops to the community. ERTs contribute to the socioeconomic development of surrounding neighborhoods um, by uh, using spaces in the firm that's not used for whatever they produce, that's their main uh, focus of production, to cultural centers, to K-12 and adult popular education initiatives for impoverished communities and surrounding neighborhoods, for health clinics, free health clinics, for instance. Chilever and UST are two very active uh, firms in the community in this regard. And then they actually extend the workplace out into the community and they reinvest their surpluses into the, commun into the community. And UST, for example, is the best, uh, the, the the kind of the most vivid example here, that they actually contribute portions of their revenues, right, to local economic development outside of the firm. Why do they do this? Because the community helped them in taking over these workplaces and because their workers are part of the community. And so they understand intimately that um, uh, helping the community economically and socially and culturally actually helps their, their business as well. Right, so it's not just through because of uh, altruistic purposes, or, or although there is a lot of that in these transformations that these workers uh, take on. The other major thing, just to show how extreme this is, uh, in in many of these uh, uh, workplaces, is that UST, being a construction firm as well, created, and here's a picture of them, dignified and affordable homes for uh, for workers. 50% of them went to workers that lived in local shanty towns, and the other 50% went to local community people that had undignified working, um, uh, sorry, undignified living conditions. This is all summarized and conceptualized by the ERT workers as la fabrica abierta, or the open factory, right? Where the secret of a capitalist firm is torn asunder, and actually the productive entity is in, entrenched intimately into the local community. Um, and with that, I just wanted to quickly go through these, mass, these last slides. Um, ERTs, or business conversions to cooperatives, are also found in other parts of the world. Ones like Argentina are found in six major countries, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and in Spain, uh, France and Italy. We also find them in pockets in the US and Canada, although I, I don't know of one that resembles uh, to this extent uh, uh, in Canada, but there's other ways of converting cooperatives in Canada that I'd like to kind of talk about as a response to the current COVID crisis during the, the, um, during the Q and A session. We can conceptualize ERTs as part of a broader phenomenon of business conversions to cooperatives. Uh, and I have found in my studies over the past 15 years three types. We have the labor conflict conversion, which is the type of conversion that happens in Argentina. This, this kind of more dramatic uh, conversion where um, there are extreme uh, rates of exploitation, um, uh, where there are socioeconomic crises and workers take over firms uh, in ways that um, initially break pro property rights, but ultimately transform those rights. So, 
what happens in Argentina and these other countries are labor conflict conversions, second series of set of conversions that are uh, present in Canada too are negotiated conversions, where basically there's a negotiation that happens between the retiring owner, workers, maybe unions, the cooperative sector, or the state. Quebec has many of these. In another project I'm working on called Co-op Convert, we've traced 110, um, not including uh, the housing sector, the housing co-op sector in Canada. And many of these, most of these reside in Quebec, although they exist across Canada, and I'll show you some examples. And then we have partial conversions, which are conversions where uh, the workers don't have ownership of the firm, but have a say in the firm, or have a say in the firm, or have ownership of the firm, like ESOPs, but don't have a say in the firm. So I call these partial conversions. And lest you think this isn't possible in Canada, I want to show you four examples, or I want to quickly suggest four examples, and you could research them on your own, right? CareForce, which was a conversion to a cooperative um, led by its mostly female and um, immigrant female visible minority care home care workers in Nova Scotia, uh, was a business conversion to cooperative that um, was demutualized last year and, and is no longer cooperative, but had been so for over for about a decade. And it's a promising case. Arise Architects is a new case of architects in, in Guelph, Ontario, that um, uh, became a cooperative in 2019. Um, one of the oldest conversion models in Canada, examples, is the ambulance sector, in uh, part of the ambulance sector in Quebec. And finally, uh, Capital Media, which are a, a, a collection of six newspapers from uh, Quebec that have um, uh, that have become a cooperative of journalists, and this is an answer to um, the dying of um, a community newspapers from across Canada. And so this brings me to an end uh, of my formal presentation, and uh, I do have several um, thoughts around what lessons can we learn from Argentina's ERTs and the crisis in Argentina for our current. COVID-19 moment. And so I'm going to summarize these in a minute, and then we can open it up to discussion. But I view the crisis of the neoliberal system in Argentina as a national uh, um, a national microcosm, so it's not a microcosm, it's a national case of what the world is experiencing now, that, that the district, that the um, uh, the massive distribution, let's call it that, of COVID-19, because it was distributed through our, um, through, our distribu through the capitalism's distribution system, right, um, emerged because of the massive failures and collapse of the neoliberal model, and especially the globalized neoliberal model, right? That the comparative advantage that neoclassical economists tout as uh, the defining characteristic of our global economy is no longer sustainable that when we have to ship off and offshore um, most of our productive uh, capacities to China, Mexico, and other countries in the global south, we then lose the capacity to quickly create masks and, um, uh, and uh, respiratory mechanisms. We cannot cope with the extent uh, of this crisis and of the, um, of the spread of COVID-19. And therefore we had to quarantine and, and shut down because the hospitals in part couldn't handle the potential mass of patients. This is what's happening in the US. This to me is a massive dereliction of nation states like Canada uh, that they've allowed the system to unfold in the way that it has at the expense of its once strong national productive economy. I think also what we can learn is from the cooperative principles and the final two cooperative principles that we should, when we start to think about rebuilding our economy, we have to start to think about principle six of the cooperative principles, cooperatives cooperating. And that means local businesses cooperating. And then seventh, the seventh principle, concern for community. This has to be embedded into our, um, um, into our uh, business thinking and local economic um, development. Um, and finally, I want to say that this crisis is really putting into relief what really matters and who really matters in the economy today. And all the talk of essential workers today, they were always essential workers, 
right? It's just that mainstream uh, discourses around this is now showing how crucial people that are involved in distributing and manufacturing um, and delivering the things that we need and caring for us in the ways that we need, how really important they were. And we can't relegate all of this to the private sector. And I think one response would be uh, the cooperative sector. And I think uh, we should start to seriously think about in Canada, and I, uh, and I put it out there to all our governments, but also unions and uh, large corporations, the cooperative sector, to when we're thinking about re-envisioning the post-COVID-19 economy, um, that we have to think about more of a cooperative economy and less of a competitive economy. So that brings my uh, formal part of my discussion to a close, and I guess we have time now for Q&A, right? I don't, I can't see all of you out there, but I understand that there are questions. So, uh, Karen, you want to kind of lead this part? Yes, thanks, Marcelo. Thank you for that. And there have been questions coming in as you have spoken, so I will okay. try to organize those and uh, direct as we go, knowing we may struggle actually to get through all of them in the last in the next fifteen minutes. But so, Karen, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could collect. Is it possible to collect the questions and I can reach out to to people after or maybe collectively yeah answer. don't worry about that side we have everything captured in the system so we'll for sure let Marcelo know all the questions who posed them in case we don't get to everything and if, and anyone can reach out to Marcelo after as well for follow-up yep. information maybe just on that note to be clear because there's you know clarifying in here getting access to the PDF yes we can find a way to send a, a link to download that very large file Plus, uh, there's a really great summary of Marcelo's book on his website, vieta.ca. So I'll put in the chat the link to that as uh, Marcelo starts rolling on questions. Can I just say something so, yeah. really quickly? About, yeah. This, this is my book, and it's 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 a hardback, and it's really expensive right now. But it's coming out in November as a as a much more affordable forty dollar, thirty dollar soft cover. So if you great. want to buy it. You let, let me know and I'll, and I'll put you on the list. <laughs> okay, so there was a question very early on and it was related to an early slide, which is just a clarifying term question, which was defining resistive subjectivities. Ah. Like, what is that? <laughs> right, that's an easy question. Well, for in the case of Argentina and for workers, it's that workers can't, don't, don't wanna take it anymore. They don't wanna be subservient anymore. And so um, they decide to rebel and say, I'm not coming to work anymore. So what compels uh, a worker to do that when their job is on the line, when they won't get a paycheck if they don't come to work, right? So it takes a lot uh, to convince most people that are reliant on paychecks. And this is the way the capitalist system is designed. It, we're we're um, compelled to use it to meet our livelihoods, Right, we, we need to sell our, our, our labor to employers to be able to buy bread and to be able to buy food. This is what the cooperative movement and sector offers as an alternative to. We don't have to, we can collectively own our workplaces and our grocery stores and our farms. And so we don't have to rely on the coercive measures of capitalism, right? So by resistive subjectivity is when a worker decides you know what, I've had enough, I've been exploited enough, and I'm gonna take over a firm. I mean, it's pretty extreme, right? Um, and in Argentina, it was a confluence of things that came together in those beginning slides that I that I uh, was referring to and that kind of uh, my description of the crisis. It wasn't just one thing. It wasn't just one workplace deciding. That's why we don't see them to the degree that we do in Argentina, because in Canada, we haven't really had a crisis that's the entire system collapsing as experienced, as Argentina experienced in 2001. If one workplace goes under, uh, here in Canada, up until two months ago, it was likely that we could get a job somewhere else. I mean, it's easier, or we can, there's other, other things that the state offers us, right? On in, employment insurance and that. In Argentina, all this had collapsed. So workers did extreme things like take over workplaces and create them and uh, convert them to co-ops. So they became resistive subjectivities. They, they became rebellious subjectivities to the system, not out of their own will at the beginning, but out of need and necessity. By the way, I Great, think- Great, thanks. 
I also think this crisis might open up an opportunity for some a similar similar type of takeovers in Canada. And I hear that the Fudora workers, by the way, are considering um, alternatives like creating per, perhaps a worker co-op, and they're discussing amongst themselves if this is the case. I don't know if you know about what happened there, but they unionized and then Daily Hero, their um, umbrella, their own German owner shut them down, right? Okay. Okay. Well, great. Start with an easy question. Yeah. <laughs> this next one, and, and as these came in earlier as you're speaking, you know, you, they might um, make sense to you in the context of when they may have been raised. Another one that came in earlier was someone reflecting on, you know, was there something similar to an unemployment insurance safety net in Argentina in the 1990s and 2000s? that did not exist in the US in the Great Depression, and there was also an explosion of recuperated uh, enterprises and barter clubs. Yes. Uh, yes and no. Not to the same extent that we have here. It, it's it's not a, necessarily in Argentina. It wasn't at the time, and especially in the 90s, it was, it was all dismantled. So whatever social protections existed, much of it was dismantled. In Argentina, traditionally, social security is linked to work. So it's linked to uh, unions. And so that's why it's a country, it was traditionally a country with a large union take up. Most workers were part of unions and it's the unions that deliver um, social security, unemployment insurance, um, and even health, even hospitals. Argentina has a tripartite system of healthcare, private, public, and union, uh, obras sociales. But in the 1990s with the dismantling of the state, whatever state protections had existed, stopped existing and this i didn't mention something at the core of this massive transformation in argentina this neoliberalization of argentina at the 1990s um was the the preparation for this massive neoliberalization that occurred in the 1970s with the military dictatorship of 76 to 83. so argentina and chile were the two test beds for neoliberalism and actually, it has bloody hands because in Argentina, 30,000 people disappeared and many of them were workers. Most of them were working people. So this dismantled a lot of the social securities that uh, had been in place since the 40s in Argentina. Again, that's why workers had to take matters into their own hands. But now you do see after the return of a left government in the, in the early 2000s uh, and now again, uh, with Fernando, uh, with um, Alberto Fernandez, you see social plans emerged after 2001. Um, and Argentina, by the way, had a really progressive form of CERB or the uh, wage subsidies. So this government, first of all, it, it made sure that everybody could eat. So the poorest people received money first with the COVID-19 crisis. The second thing it did it guaranteed salary top-ups to all businesses in Argentina to prevent um, layoffs. And then third, it set up a new system of, um, uh, of something similar to CERB in Argentina. So really, really progressive. And it managed, and really harsh quarantine measures. So you don't see the, the spread, the COVID-19 spread has been pretty much contained in Argentina. I mean, it's, it's still present and it's still there, but when you compare it, Argentina has about the same, it's about 40 million people, 5 million people more than Canada. And the differences between the spread of COVID-19 is, is stark. I think some of these new benefits helped keep keeping people at home, for example. Okay, thanks Marcelo. And uh, it may seem like we're shifting gears as these questions are in very different places. The next one I'll throw out at you is, Someone wondering if ERTs and radical social innovation is seen as a way to accelerate growth and development throughout Argentina. Is this a sustainable model for future development? That's a that's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I think it is, uh, but I think we have to reconceptualize what what we mean by development and um, and economic growth. I think that um, as it is now, just I just want to contextualize it. These are we're talking about four hundred firms. Argentina's cooperative movement is almost 30,000 co-ops and about 20,000 of them are worker co-ops. It's got the largest worker cooperative movement in the world. So why am I focusing on 400 of these conversions, right? 
Um, so that's one thing. Um, and the second thing is because they're small, right? They they, they do promise to reconvert uh, the economy, but they can't do so on their own. So they need assistance by the government. Now, in part, right? Now, let me just quickly um, touch on why I'm focusing on 400 when there's like 20,000 worker co-ops in Argentina, because a majority of these 20,000 worker or so worker co-ops formed out of um, social, out of government-based programs to deliver social wel welfare uh, and social safety. Um, yeah, basically it's, so, it's social welfare through the creation of co-ops. So it's kind of a work, work for welfare scheme that then creates these co-ops. And many of these co-ops, the people, you know, the, they're, they're state funded in essence. And so the ICA might have a problem with like, well, is this really, they're not really autonomous from the state. Although many of them emerge and become really um, proactive and, and, and really good cooperatives, but others are formed just as a, as a, as a shell to, for workers, to, these otherwise unemployed workers to be able to receive unemployment insurance. This is unsustainable as a, as a cooperative movement and to re recreate um, uh, a future economy that's a cooperative economy. Now, interesting, a lot of these co-ops receive state contracts. And so in Argentina, when you go to Argentina, Buenos Aires, and you see street cleaners or garbage collectors, most of these workers are organized as cooperatives because they come from uh, these programs to deliver social security. Many of these, by the way, were, were the piqueteros, were the public sector workers that were unemployed en masse in the 1990s that then couldn't find work, became garbage collectors, and now work in co-ops. The ERT movement emerged parallel to this, right? They weren't people seeking out to be cooperators, but they became so out of need because their workshop was closing and because the cooperative movement in Argentina already has a long history. Uh, the cooperative movement in Argentina is the is the oldest in the world outside of North America, Canada, the US, Europe, and Japan. And so it's been around since the 1900s and it already knows how to do cooperativism. So when workers got together in many ERTs that were emerging in the early 2000s and decided, what do we do? Do we ask the government to nationalize us and we'll work for government publicly, public sector firms? The government wasn't willing to do that. So what they did was they created cooperatives because it was a forum that was already available. Now, let me say that they are potentially sustainable for recreating the economy, I think. We can convert more and more co-op uh, workplaces to co-ops if there is enough uh, support uh, or if there's an ecosystem or um, an enabling environment. Italy, for example, has a really rich environment of converting uh, co-ops to, or uh, businesses to co-ops, and also as a solution to succession, right? So I, I believe we can create more and more of a cooperative economy. I think it can be scaled up, um, but it, it's all, it, we also have to think, well, what do we want to scale up with? What do we need more of and less of in our economy? And that requires a collective conversation, I think. But I, but I think the cooperative sector has a lot to say there. And in Argentina, the ERT movement has is, is having a say now, kind of an oversized say because of the impact they've made and the jobs they've saved. And now they're part of the, the national government in various positions. This is tough, Marcelo. We only have five more minutes and we will close on time. And there are actually a lot of questions. So you'll have your work cut out for you after the fact and <laughs> we're coming up with some good responses. But it's um, great to have know, this. Yeah, yeah. So I will I will answer all the questions. Yeah, well, hopefully <laughs> you'll see them Yeah, as valuable. And um, uh, but I'll yeah. try to ask one more and maybe we'll get to two more. So there's yeah. a question about how can ERTs keep working without resources in this crisis and if that makes uh, sense. So that's, so, they're, so they're in crisis again now. So they're asking for uh, government assistance. They are using um, these government's wage subsidies. Um, they have asked for a fund, a collective fund that what this in this new law that they're proposing. Um, they're asking for something similar to what happens in Italy, <clears throat> where all cooperatives in Italy have to, and in Spain, and there's a similar uh, model, where all co-ops give X percent of their revenues to cooperative development, and they're wanting to develop a system where the state, out of the national budget, contributes half of this fund, 
and the cooperative sector contributes another half, say 3% of revenues, and that would be a way to sustain, um, to capitalize. So capitalization has been really tough. That's why many of these firms haven't been able to, to grow as much as they could have or to hire on new workers as much as they could have. But the, all, the other call is, for governments, and this happened in the early 2000s for the for local, municipal, provincial, and the federal government of Argentina to actually uh, practice social procurement. So buy from these firms, right? Um, when you have when you so uh, uh, Chilaved would produce brochures for um, for the executive branch of the Argentine government. Um, textile firms produce uniforms for public sector workers. Right. This has been a way that they've managed to recreate their customer base and um, and kind of become a, kind of a public, publicly facing, socially directed cooperative um, experience. So that's how they've been able to do it. Then cobbling together resource, cobbling together resources, um, engaging with customers as a, as collectivities. So if I'm a print, if I'm a printing firm. I do the binding, you do the paper, you do the printing, and it will kind of come together as a co collective of print shops. That's another way that they do it. So they're creative with it, right? But there's also um, a, a demand and uh, an ask of the state to support, not just by giving money and subsidies and grants, but actually by doing this, by practicing uh, purchasing, direct purchasing of whatever the state needs from these co-ops. Do you have time for one more question? <laughs> so let's try to squeeze it in. I'll try to combine two. There's uh, one that's getting at you know your ideas, and I think you touched on some of these, but maybe you could use it as your closing thought, but you have to save me one minute. So you have one minute to respond in terms of uh, support, your ideas to support a more humane and resilient economy post-pandemic. Closing mm -hmm. thought on that, Marcelo. Yeah, yeah. So I already mentioned some. I So I think Canada can, so let's just bring us a Canada. We have um, the the Canadian Independent Business Network, or CI, you know what I'm talking about, the, the Network of Independent Businesses in Canada. They are, they have a rolling um, um, have a rolling survey that they're doing, and they found that um, in Ontario, five percent of businesses SMEs will never open again. The other 30% of SMEs after this crisis, 30% of SMEs um, or 50% of SMEs might not open again, and the rest are having a really hard time. So one solution is convert them to co-ops and let the community reorganize them. They already have the assets. Pay off the owner. You can do this, right? The owner can doesn't have to be left hung and high and dry. The owner can become a member of a co-op, but create community ownership and um, worker ownership of these firms, and that's one way that we can save these businesses. I just want to thank you. No, that's excellent, Marcelo. And I love the energy of this last hour. Uh, <laughs> an hour goes quickly. So a reminder that the recording of this full hour will be up on our website, managementstudies.coop, as soon as it's ready in the go-to webinar system. Uh, we've sent a link in the chat to Marcelo's website where there's a book summary. But if you just remember vieta.ca, uh, it's easy to find. Please stay in touch with the International Center for Cooperative Management. If you have any interest or suggestions around our programs, do let us know. And to say that uh, in your registration for this webinar, we put you on our e-news list. And that way, if you uh, wish to unsubscribe at any time, you can, but it'll keep you abreast of future webinars. And we do have a webinar series starting up in the fall. So huge thanks to Marcelo. Uh, my you. friend and co-conspirator yep. on other things. And that does conclude today's webinar. I thank you all for engaging in this topic with us today. Bye, everybody.